A game is only as strong as its first level. Confucius, 492 BCE. Sure, many games are bangers from start to finish, but the first level sets the tone for the game to follow. It's often what future levels are compared to, whether you're racing to the top of Bob-omb Battlefield in Super Mario 64, or just murdering the local population at the beginning of Resident Evil 4, first levels usually give you a grasp of what the game's about before throwing you into the thick of it. Hi, welcome back to Project Redui, the only series where I remake classic levels and assets from the original Banjo-Kazooie for the Nintendo 64. I'm aggressive because I'm back. I've been away a long time, but I'm back. Bringing you that heat. It's been a really good day. I've had a really good day. It's been a really, I've been hard at work in these last few months working on this video and there's a lot to cover. So let's get right into it. First things first, I wanted to give a huge shout out to Wannabe Composer 64 here on YouTube. He arranged the music for this episode's trailer and, might I say, did an amazing job. He really took the theme to some interesting places and you should definitely check out the full arrangement in the description. As you can see, I remade Mumbo's Mountain from the ground up in HD, just like Spiral Mountain earlier this year. This level though is a lot more complicated and had a lot more going on from the characters to the collectibles and everything in between. It's also a much bigger level. Now let's take a closer look at the level in detail. Starting out of the player's spawn, we can see a lot of what this level's got to offer. We can see landmarks like Ticker's Tower and those ancient ruins off in the distance. In our more immediate surroundings, our first set of enemies in Mumbo's Mountain. These purple guys are grublins. They walk around Mumbo's Mountain in search of any big dumb bears or stinky little birds to meet up. That's their official job description, so watch out for these fellas as we continue our tour. Moving right along, what was that? Help! D did you hear something? Oh, right, yeah, Mumbo's Mountain is also home to our first set of Jinjos in the game. I use that term home loosely, as these guys seem to be a little lost. Uh, don't worry, buddy, help is on the way. Uh, just between you and me, I think this guy's gonna be here for a while. Anyway, across the bridge and over the water, past another Jinjo, you may have noticed Big Butt. Yeah, Big Butt. Uh, Big Butt the Bull, named after his, um, horns? He's a giant bull with a penchant for violence, so please try to keep your distance. If you do wind up crossing paths with this guy, don't hesitate to use the local beehive for those sweet, sweet honeycombs. Moving to the far corner of the level, Kanga the ape stands atop his orange tree. Let us marvel at the great ape's physique. Ugh, geez, better stay away from this guy. He looks tough. Kanga's design was lifted from the original game much in the same way as Bottles. Uh, more on that later in the breakdown. You'll probably notice a slight change of color in the rock face in this area. I suppose there's something of a microbiome inside of Mumbo's Mountain, a little bit of a jungle over here. More research will need to be conducted, but it does lend a bit of a unique vibe to this corner of the map. Chimpy the monkey can also be spotted in this area, and boy does he look hungry. <laughs> Moving up this steep hill, we can see some ancient ruins home to a jiggy. This area is pretty dense with collectibles, and we can get a closer look at things like the jiggy, notes, and mumbo tokens here. The use of reflection probes throughout the map give every gold and silver collectible an accurate reflection, just a little something made possible in a remake. On the opposite side of the level, we can see one of the more memorable landmarks of Mumbo's Mountain. This zone is home to Mumbo's Hut, as well as several other huts surrounding a stack of jujus. The juju statues rotate ominously, and I do wonder what would happen if, say, a bird came along to shoot some eggs at them. I guess we'll never know. 
We can see some more grublins surrounding the huts. I wonder if they live here. In the corner of this area is Mumbo's Hut, home to my personal favorite Banjo-Kazooie character, Mumbo Jumbo. What lies inside? Well, I suppose I might have to wait for another episode. And finally, Ticker's Tower, the biggest and most familiar landmark here in Mumbo's Mountain. It's a big old tower, surrounded by creepy, crawly Ticker the Termites. Let's take a peek inside, shall we? Wow, talk about a place that's bigger on the inside. These platforms hugging the walls look a bit too steep for, say, a bear to climb, but these termites seem to have no problem getting up here. Ticker's Tower has several layers, each packed with collectibles, like eggs and notes. It seems like there's an opening at the top. Well, let's take a peek. Whew, we sure are high up. Ugh. Well, uh, just between you and me, I'm afraid of heights, so uh, I'm gonna check out here. Uh, enjoy the view, I'll see you at the bottom. So that's Mumbo's Mountain, fully remade in HD. It was a really fun and really long project, and I hope you enjoy. My goal is always to remake these levels as faithfully as possible, updating and modernizing aspects of them when possible. Now, if you'll allow me, I want to take you back, take a peek behind the curtain, and uh, show you how this whole thing came together. So uh, let's uh, let's get into that. Things are going to get a little big brain here, and I'm going to use some big words and try to define them, so we'll see how this goes. The first step in remaking this level, and really any level in this series, was to extract the original game's level geometry from the game's ROM file. This is possible thanks to Banjo's Backpack, a modding tool for the original Banjo-Kazooie. It's usually used to edit the game's data, allowing for ambitious mods like the Jiggies of Time and Cutthroat Coast. Banjo's Backpack also includes a model viewer with the option to export to .obj files. These .obj files can then be imported into 3D software like Blender to be edited, or in our case, to be used as a reference for a new higher poly count model. Now, to put it simply, 3D models are made up of polygons, and depending on the hardware they're being rendered on, models can have either low or high poly counts. The Nintendo 64 released in 1996, meaning that any models rendered in real time on this console needed to be relatively low poly so that the game can run at a semi-decent frame rate. Your mileage may vary on that one. If Banjo-Kazooie were actually to be remade today, the hardware running the remake would be quite a bit more capable than the humble Nintendo 64. Technology has advanced to the point where game developers can cram models with millions of polygons into their games without taking too much of a hit on performance. For the purposes of this series, and with the full extent of my own skills and experience, the models in this series fall somewhere in the middle, allowing for much more detail than the Nintendo 64 models, but still low poly enough to run on a computer without a jet engine strapped to the GPU. More detail can then be added via normal and height maps, more on that in a bit. In order to keep this new high poly geometry consistent with the original shape of the Nintendo 64 geometry, I heavily referenced the model I imported earlier. I did this by bringing that model into the scene and then adding a plane for our new model. Adding a subdivision surface modifier, which basically just takes all of the faces of this model and splits them into equal parts and smooths it all out, I can start to extrude and nudge each vertex edge and face of the model until I have essentially a denser copy of the original game's model. It sounds simple on paper, but it did take a long, long time to finish this process up. It's probably the most time-consuming part of this entire process. One small criticism I received about the Spiral Mountain video is that the resulting geometry is a little too smooth, losing some of the strong edges of the original model, and I completely agree. To remedy this, I used the Edge Crease feature in Blender, letting me define creases along the hard edges of the terrain. This results in geometry that looks more defined and consistent with the original game. With the main terrain of this level done, I made new models of things like stone ruins, tree stumps, and huts scattered around the level. With all that done, we can move on to the next phase, applying textures and creating materials. I used the exact same technique to apply this level's textures that I did with the Spiral Mountain video, but I'll go over it in a bit more detail here. One of my favorite parts of the look of Nintendo 64 games, particularly the games that Rare put out in the late 1990s, is how organic all the environments feel. This is due to a technique called vertex painting. Vertex painting is the process of assigning colors to individual vertices of a model, which can influence the colors and the textures of that model when rendered in a game engine. The colors blend into one another, resulting in more natural, smooth look to the environments. Another thing to go over is what's called triplanar mapping. When you're applying textures to a model, you need to map the texture onto the faces of the model, or rather unwrap the model onto the textures. This is really important for any textured model in the game, but some models pose a bigger challenge to unwrap than others. Take a large environment like Mumbo's Mountain, for instance. The landscape is varied and complex, parts overlapping and overlooking other areas. If I were to unwrap this traditionally, it would have been an absolute nightmare. Trust me, I've tried. Lucky for us, we have triplanar mapping as a pretty elegant solution. 
Instead of using a UV map to define how the faces of a model map onto the textures, we can use triplanar mapping to project textures onto the surfaces on three axes, smoothly interpolating between them, resulting in seamless mapping on all the model surfaces. At the intersection of vertex painting and triplanar mapping, we find how I textured most of the land that you see here at this level. Uh, like I mentioned in the Spiral Mountain video, I used Unity's HD Layered Shader to layer up to three PBR materials into one, and blend between them via vertex colors. Now there are definitely more than three textures shared across all of the land in this level, so I had to get a little creative, making and assigning multiple materials to different parts of the map, making sure there's no sharp cuts between textures. So what are PBR materials anyway? Well, PBR, or physically based rendering, is a term used to describe the method of rendering based on real physical properties, rather than the more abstract values used in older shaders. Over the last decade or so, big game engines like Unity, Unreal, and Godot started incorporating PBR shaders as a standard for materials. In Unity HDRP, the standard PBR shader has inputs for base map, which influences the color of a material. Think of it as a diffuse texture. This base map can be tinted, which I use a lot to bring out the colors more in line with the original game without having to edit the colors of the textures themselves. Another input on the shader is for a normal map. Normal maps look like this, and they tell the renderer how light should bounce off of a material. They can be a lot more detailed than the actual geometry of a model and give the material an incredible level of depth. See here how the position of a light can affect an object with a normal map. Pretty cool, right? If you want to actually affect the geometry of an object, you can use a height map, which can move vertices of an object along its normals. Lastly, HDRP standard materials have a slot for mask maps, which are actually pretty neat. See, images are typically made up of three to four channels, red, green, blue, and alpha. The mask map splits these channels and assigns the value of each channel to things like metallic, ambient occlusion, detail mask, and smoothness. All these inputs go into materials, which go into each slot of a layered shader, bringing it all together. I use the same handy dandy grass shader as before, shout out to Brute Force Games for that. It really takes the whole presentation to another level. And with all that said, let's take a look at how this level's various character NPCs came together, shall we? Probably the part that took the most time was creating all of the critters scattered throughout the level, and that's for good reason. For one thing, there's just so many of these guys that I had to make from scratch. Another thing to note is just how complex each of these characters were to bring to life. Each one of them required a new HD model, rig, textures, and animation, and a few even needed some basic AI to really get going. Definitely a big step up from the work I put into the simple enemies of Spiral Mountain. After all is said and done though, I would say it's worth it, and Mumbo's Mountain just isn't the same without them. That being said, my limitations as an artist sort of show <laughs> in some of these characters, so keep that in mind as we continue. First up are the Noble Jinjos. These fellows were probably the simplest characters to remake, as they only had a few animations, virtually no AI, and could be recolored very easily. Like in the Bottles video, I used Substance Painter to create the textures for all the characters in this episode. If you look very closely, you can see some detail in the Jinjo skin, some light bumps, and almost a glittery sheen to them. Given that the Jinjos act as more collectibles than actual NPCs, they don't need to actually move around all that much, and the programming was as simple as just looping a few animations. Next up are the Grublins, the first of many baddies scattered throughout the many worlds of Banjo-Kazooie. The Grublins patrol the starting area of Mumbo's Mountain, and they were quite a bit more challenging to put together. This is due to a few different factors. Uh, for one thing, I had to model clothing over the character models. For things like pants and shirts, you can usually follow the same topology, and they're a lot more straightforward to skin and animate. But with something like a skirt, it was a little bit more difficult, but, but I think the end result looks pretty good. Another thing that set this character apart was the pathfinding AI. For the Spiral Mountain video, I used a very rudimentary system that used predefined points in the scene, which worked for the most part, but it takes a lot of time to set up for each instance of a character. For this video, I instead opted to use Unity's pathfinding package, which allowed me to make one pathfinding solution and customize it a bit for each character. Right across the river here, we can find Big Butt the Bull. Yes, once again, I will remind you, his name is Big Butt. Once again, Big Butt is a unique case. As a quadruped, he had to be modeled, rigged, and animated a bit differently. I also tweaked the aforementioned AI system so that he can stop and eat some grass. Uh, that grass sure looks good. These little guys surrounding Ticker's Tower are, well, Tickers. These guys, I think, turned out the best out of all the characters I had to turn out for this level. I really like the way that I handled the rigging, especially for these guys. I made an IK rig so I could control each leg independently, which led to some pretty straightforward animations. Yeah, I like them. You can also see that their materials have a bit of subsurface scattering to really sell the, uh, the creepy crawly aspect of the tickers. Moving on, Chimpy and especially Congo were really tough to get right, 
And I think they look pretty good. Look, I'm just one guy, and this is as good a time as any to point out that this is one big learning process for me. Any stiffness in animation or rough looking textures that you may see, rest assured that I see it too. This project has pushed me in ways that I couldn't have even imagined when I started, and I've learned so much and will continue to learn as I keep moving forward. One thing I do want to note is the design that I chose for Conga. If you're in the know when it comes to cancelled Banjo-Kazooie projects, you may know about Banjo-X. Banjo-X was a cancelled remake of Banjo-Kazooie for the Xbox that eventually spiraled into nuts and bolts. Over the years we've seen development footage surface from Banjo-X, including a redesigned Conga and Ticker. Now, I really do like these designs, and the nuts and bolts style is an interesting direction that I think gets a lot of unfair flack. I chose not to lean into these designs though, just to stay consistent with the same design philosophy as the other characters have already worked on. That's it for Mumbo's Mountains characters, but we still have a few details to go over before it's time to pack up. In my last big level video, the only collectible I really had to model was the Honeycomb Beast, which does make a return in Mumbo's Mountain alongside several others, each with their own set of challenges. The jiggies and notes were pretty straightforward using the same gold material as the Honeycomb Piece. In this level, however, I opted to use reflection probes around the level to get more accurate reflections. Reflection probes are basically little 360 degree cameras that take a snapshot of their surrounding areas and map what they see onto reflective materials that the area that they're placed in. These probes came in handy for another type of collectible found in Mumbo's Mountain, Mumbo Tokens. This currency is first found in Mumbo's Mountain and bears a resemblance to a human skull. Kind of creepy, and the fact that it has actual eyeballs just kind of takes it up a notch. The official sprite used in this game is a little low res, so I took a few creative liberties going for a minimal stylized look. I think it's pretty close to the original. Lastly, Kazooie's blue eggs make their first appearance here, and have a fun little bouncing animation, the timing of which is randomized to give them some variety. The collectibles were a huge part of making this level feel like it came right out of a real remake, when without them, it's just a little empty. When it came to giving the level a final layer of polish, I leaned heavily into volumetric fog in this level. Using box volumes, I was able to vary the amount of fog in certain areas. From the ground level, the fog is pretty subtle, but as you get higher, the fog rolls in thicker to simulate being high up on a mountain. I think it really adds a lot and gives the level some more implied verticality. Taking that into consideration with the moving clouds in the sky, and this level really comes together and looks pretty lively. With all that said, I think the sun is setting on this episode of Project Redewey. Just wanted to give a huge thank you to anybody who made it to the end of this video. And if you liked it, please leave a like. Consider subscribing if you want to see more. I've got more videos like this planned as well as some other stuff to try to branch out and do some other things because these videos do take a long time. So stay tuned for that. You can follow me over on Twitter at Cagley Time. I'm going to give you a little kiss.